From vengeful fathers to parasitic aliens, some famous movies just come before their time. These horror movies are the scream of the crop of box office flops. The Sun Deal and Lawrence Fishburne-led horror Event Horizon is nothing short of an unforgettable descent into hellish madness. The film follows the crew of a starship in the year 2047, which is tasked with answering the distress signal of another spacefaring vessel called the Event Horizon. This mysterious ship has suddenly disappeared seven years prior during its maiden voyage and has now eerily reappeared in orbit around Neptune. What the crew finds on the event horizon is the stuff of nightmares. The crew has been massacred, and the ship's visual records depict the crew members losing their minds and engaging in sexual activity and body mutilation. The rescue crew then begin seeing horrific hallucinations that recall their own individual histories. The mysteries of the event horizon all revolve around its strange disappearance. Experimental space travel effectively took the ship to another dimension, hell. Where we're going, we won't need eyes to see. Director Paul W.S. Anderson was riding high after the success of the 1995 movie adaptation of the popular video game Mortal Kombat, but shifting from PG-13 material to R-rated horror proved to be financially detrimental for the director. Upon its 1997 release, Event Horizon only grossed nearly $42 million worldwide against a $60 million budget. Critically, it was panned for its excessive gore according to the Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus. However, horror fans began flocking to the film in droves as years passed, causing multiple home editions to be released and spurring on another examination of the film's critical standing. Even casual film fans around at the time can recall the stir generated by The Sixth Sense, the 1999 film about a young boy who can see dead people put director M. Night Shyamalan on the map. However, there was another film released that year featuring a protagonist who could see the dead, and it was fatefully overshadowed by the swelling popularity of The Sixth Sense. In Stir of Echoes, Tom Witzke, played by Kevin Bacon, is a blue-collar phone line repairman working in the suburbs of Chicago. He's a skeptic of the supernatural, but agrees to allow his sister-in-law to hypnotize him. During the alleged hypnosis, she suggests that Tom be more open-minded. From this point forward, he begins seeing visions of a ghostly apparition of a 17-year-old girl, who wants Tom to help her complete some unfinished business. While the film wasn't a complete financial failure, it wasn't a success either, and only garnered a $21 million gross, according to Box Office Mojo. The film actually received praise from critics thanks to its great cast, tension-filled story, and solid source material, as it's based on horror master Richard Matheson's 1958 novel A Stir of Echoes. However, many noted that it was just released too closely to The Sixth Sense, since it came out just a month after Shyamalan's hit. The film simply suffered from hitting the big screen at the wrong time. But once The Sixth Sense phenomenon died down, horror fans were able to rediscover Stir of Echoes after its home video release. Despite its middling Rotten Tomatoes scores, Stir of Echoes continues to be a subject of discussion for film critics and horror fans alike. Based on Jeff Vandermeer's novel of the same name, the Alex Garland-directed sci-fi psychological horror Annihilation perplexed moviegoers with its enigmatic story and underlying philosophy. The film posits that alien contact might not be the cut-and-dry scenario we've always envisioned. A meteor crash lands on Earth and creates an ever-expanding zone the government has dubbed the Shimmer. Those who have gone inside the Shimmer haven't returned, until one soldier named Kane, played by Oscar Isaac, finally does. However, he's been affected by the zone and enters a coma. His wife Lena, played by Natalie Portman, is a biologist and volunteers to join an expedition into the Shimmer in hopes of finding answers about her husband's condition. When did he arrive back home? I want to see a lawyer. You're not going to be able to see a lawyer. What the group finds is that life inside the Shimmer has been mutated. Horrific animal monstrosities attack the group. They even find the bodies of those who have gone before, albeit heavily disfigured. As Lena makes her way to Ground Zero, she begins to learn a bit about herself and her relationship with her husband. While Annihilation may have been a critical darling for its provocative themes, the audiences simply didn't show up. With a production budget of $40 million and a worldwide gross of $43 million, the studio likely lost money once marketing costs were factored in. Publications like IndieWire and The Guardian argued that the movie suffered because of the studio's fear of not seeing immediate returns, which meant it didn't get time to build an audience. However, thanks to the source material's popularity among sci-fi readers and the film's release on Netflix overseas, Annihilation found a second chance at life with its streaming release. 
If you have a tough stomach, then maybe you can handle the grisly imagery of the 2015 western horror Bone Tomahawk. It's the 1890s, and Sheriff Franklin Hunt learns that a tribe of cannibalistic cave dwellers who have been shunned by other indigenous communities are the likely culprits of the recent kidnappings of three people. The sheriff, played by Kurt Russell, sets out on a rescue mission with local gunslinger John Bruder, played by Matthew Fox, and Deputy Chikori, played by Richard Jenkins. Also along for the journey is the injured Arthur O'Dwyer, played by Patrick Wilson, whose wife is one of the people that has been captured. What they encounter, however, is the stuff of nightmares. While some horror fans can enjoy over-the-top gore in a campy slasher, the violence in this film is visceral, grimy, and jarring. Don't say you weren't warned. Bone Tomahawk received critical praise and even has a certified fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Most enjoyed the slow burn that paid off with the intense tension and horrors of the third act. It's hard to say that this film was a total flop, considering it only received a limited theatrical release that made over $475,000 in ticket sales, according to the numbers. For a release plan like this, it was always intended to play the long game. While the ticket sales were mighty low, home video sales spiked due to good word of mouth, which, according to The Guardian, ensured that the film was ultimately profitable in the long run. When you hear the name Peter Jackson, you likely think of his big-budget epics like the Lord of the Rings trilogy or King Kong. For this reason, many have been left in the dark about Jackson's zombie horror comedy film, Braindead, which was released in North America with the title Dead Alive. The film relishes in its namesake and brings buckets full of gore and gross-out practical effects to its ridiculous story. Lionel, played by Timothy Baum, is a young man who is taking care of his mother, Vera, played by Elizabeth Moody. Unfortunately for Lionel, Vera is extremely overbearing and wants to dominate Lionel's life at every turn. When Lionel lands a date with a young lady he takes to the Wellington Zoo, his mother follows them. While there, she is bitten by a repulsive creature. Vera soon succumbs to an illness stemming from the bites that turns her into a zombie. She winds up infecting countless others and poor Lionel is left to deal with the burgeoning undead situation. The film only grossed $242,623 at the North American box office, according to Box Office Mojo. However, the film became such a cult hit with horror fans that it has continually been released on several platforms, including VHS, Laserdisc, DVD, and Blu-ray. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Jackson wants to use his super-technologically advanced Weta digital VFX studio to remaster the film for a 4K release. Dead Alive is an absolute blast, but just make sure you're not eating anything while viewing this romp. The slasher subgenre of horror wouldn't be what it is today without John Carpenter's iconic 1978 film, Halloween. The movie created a larger-than-life movie monster in the form of the twisted serial killer Michael Myers. The indie film's popularity prompted a sequel that was released in 1981 and directed by Rick Rosenthal. With Michael Myers established as a symbol of horror, one would think that a threequel would center around his terrifying return. Instead, the filmmakers and producers opted for an anthology approach to the Halloween series, where each film would tell a different story on Halloween. Carpenter felt that Michael Myers' story was complete with Halloween 2, so Halloween 3 focused on a new cast of characters and a Michael Myers free tale. The problem is that the franchise already had two films under its belt featuring Michael Myers. Audiences had inextricably linked the killer with the Halloween name. Once moviegoers realized he wasn't featured in the third installment, the film's box office performance waned significantly. Box Office Mojo reports that Halloween 3 received a paltry $14 million gross compared to the $25 million of its predecessor and $47 million of the first film. Such a significant decrease in profit prompted filmmakers to revert back to Michael Myers with the fourth installment. Michael? Halloween 3 ditched the slasher genre entirely and embraced a different kind of horror that straddles the line between the supernatural and sci-fi. Haunted masks imprinted with the villainous company's microchip wreak havoc on an unsuspecting population. In recent years, fans have returned to the film praising its unique narrative. The film has seen new releases, including a 4K release from Shout Factory. Director Sam Raimi is no stranger to horror, with his Evil Dead franchise counted among one of the most beloved of the genre. In this installment, we follow Ash, played by Bruce Campbell, a demon-slaying, chainsaw-wielding hero whose ego rivals only his own penchant for survival. While 1981's Evil Dead started out as a small indie horror film, it quickly gained traction and led to the 1986 sequel Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn, 
which moved from pure horror to a horror-comedy combination that fans have affectionately dubbed a splatstick. It was only a matter of time before the franchise continued, which it did with 1993's Army of Darkness. The film pits Ash against the deadites of old in a medieval civilization. Ash must live up to his name as a prophesied champion and vanquish evil. While the film had the biggest budget of the original trilogy, it didn't exactly bring home the bacon during its theatrical run. Despite its $11 million budget, Army of Darkness only pulled in a measly $11.5 million in North America and $21.5 million worldwide. Still, like the film that started it all, Army of Darkness became a cult classic. In fact, Army of Darkness on home video became a gateway for a whole new generation to discover the Evil Dead films. Eventually, fan fervor pushed interested parties into making a successful reboot film in 2013, as well as the Star's TV series Ash vs. Evil Dead. There's more Evil Dead on the way, as Evil Dead Rise is scheduled to hit theaters in the spring of 2023. There's nothing quite like a good old-fashioned story of revenge and murder, and 1988's Pumpkinhead serves up vengeance nice and cold. Ed Harley, played by Lance Henriksen, is a widower and single parent of his young son Billy, played by Matthew Hurley. One day, while Ed is away for work, a group of misfit teens begin to pick on Billy. They accidentally fatally injure the boy and flee the scene. When Ed returns, he finds his deceased son and soon learns who killed Billy. The grieving Ed visits a witch and asks her to help him seek vengeance upon the teens. He called upon this thing. In that man's name and that man, he'd be avenged. She summons a demonic creature known as Pumpkinhead, who systematically hunts and kills the teens one by one. This is another film that suffered because it was released in a limited number of theaters which led to Pumpkinhead only grossing $4 million at the box office as a result. However, the film eventually found success through home video releases, as new fans discovered this terrifying and emotional film directed by Stan Winston, a special effects mastermind behind Aliens and The Terminator. Its home video success enabled the film to receive a handful of sequels which, unfortunately, don't remotely live up to the original film. George A. Romero, the father of the modern zombie, is a titan among horror fandom. 1968's Night of the Living Dead became memorable for its graphic violence and depiction of a world besieged by the cannibalistic undead. In many ways, it was the first of its kind. The horror maestro succeeded that first outing with 1978's Dawn of the Dead, a zombie horror based in a mall, rife with biting commentary on commercialism. Romero then plunged ahead with 1985's Day of the Dead, which condemns the US military's might and penchant for shooting first and asking questions later. Day of the Dead takes place in a bunker, where a group of scientists and soldiers try to survive and find a cure for the zombie plague. But it turns out the human threat is almost as serious as the zombie one. We need each other. Can't we just get you along? You need us the way I see it, lady. I'm not so sure we need you at all. Initially, the film only pulled in a worldwide total of $5 million against a $3.5 million budget, according to Box Office Mojo. However, according to Pop Matters, it got rejuvenated through home video platforms, including VHS and DVD. Day of the Dead garnered critical praise for Romero's unflinching perception of society, as well as for its horrific gore effects produced by horror legend Tom Savini. While Romero continued his Night of the Living Dead series with more films over the years, Day of the Dead capped off the best trilogy of the bunch. Your next is a modern slasher film that takes the Scream and Halloween murder games to the next level. Erin is a young Australian woman who accompanies her boyfriend Crispin Davison to his family reunion at their vacation home in Missouri. The family aren't exactly friendly or agreeable with one another. Before long, mass killers begin assaulting the home, killing everyone one by one. Erin attempts to survive the onslaught of terror with all the skills she has, as she gets to the bottom of the heinous plan carried out against the Davison family. The film features over-the-top death traps and merciless assaults with plenty of blood to go around. Your Next received mostly positive reviews from the critics, thanks to its fresh take on the final girl trope. Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus praised the film in particular, calling it an energetic and effective mix of brutal gore and pitch-black humor. I just think that is just the height of the art form these days. However, it didn't exactly land well at the box office, only making $26 million worldwide, according to Box Office Mojo. The film has got some more attention since its home video release and placement on various streaming services. Like several of these beloved cult horror films, Your Next has benefited from the modern convenience of in-home streaming services, which has turned it into a modern slasher that many people love. It's also a notable stepping stone in director Adam Wingard's career who's gone on to direct much larger productions, such as Godzilla vs. Kong. 
John Carpenter's The Thing tells the story of a hostile alien infiltrating a crew in Antarctica on a microscopic level. The alien cells assimilate the host they've infected and replace the living organism's cells with its own. Led by McCready, played by Kurt Russell, the crew attempts to figure out who's real and who's a hideous alien in disguise. The growing confusion creates an unsettling fear and sense of anxiety and dread that's largely unmatched in the horror genre. Despite the film's status as a horror legend these days, it was instantly dismissed by critics upon its release in 1982. Many were put off by the gore and practical effects that accentuate the visceral, grotesque horror of the alien thing, and they believed the film to be a soulless cash-in on the attraction to excess violence in cinema. Furthermore, the plot was accused of being stale and too simplistic. Alan Spencer wrote for Starlog magazine that the thing is a little more than two hours of makeup test footage and heavily criticized Carpenter for the film's lack of story and vision. Evidently, audiences were also turned off by Carpenter's body horror, as Box Office Mojo reports the film made just $19.6 million at the box office. In the modern age, the film has been regarded quite differently. Many have revisited its cultural impact on horror, with Wired calling it a paranoid classic and Inverse claiming that it raised the bar for sci-fi. Guillermo del Toro wrote a series of tweets praising Carpenter and The Thing, writing, the irony is that most reviewers at the time were entirely blind to the virtues of story and character. Slither is an over-the-top black comedy horror film directed and written by James Gunn that does not disappoint in the entertainment department. Whether you come away from this flick hating it or loving it, there's never a dull moment. A meteorite introduces an alien parasite into a small town in South Carolina, which promptly infects a man named Grant Grant. The alien assumes control of his body and is able to hideously transform and spout tentacles. The possessed Grant Grant abducts a woman and infects her, forcing her to breed alien lava. When the police get involved, the townsfolk focus on locating Grant and stopping the transformation of local residents. Although it was a critical success, Slither was a box office failure, raking in only $12.8 million against a $15 million budget. In fact, the reports of the film's financial failure were so abysmal that The Hollywood Reporter speculated that the film may spell the end for the horror comedy subgenre for quite some time. In the same article, horror director Eli Roth commented on the dicey nature of selling a horror comedy film, but he noted the potential for longevity, saying, In 15 years, nobody is going to be watching Ice Age The Meltdown. Everybody is going to be watching DVDs of Slither. Maybe we're watching it on streaming services now instead of DVD, but he's not wrong. It only took a decade for retrospectives to start churning out re-evaluations of the film, with publications like Entertainment Weekly calling it a cult classic.